the MCC, thank you for being here and, um, and for Martin for inviting me and it's been wonderful staying here in Hungary. So I'll try to be fairly brief and uh, what I know the ship has been sailed in Europe, but in the US it has not. It's still debated, although I think the writing's kind of on the wall, so I don't know if there's much hope. But uh, I still think it is important to at least debate the ideas. And um, as we know our Bible, uh, there's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I think it is clear that, um, as mentioned, we are targeting certain companies and their practices. And we've made a determination, at least socially, whether it's for political or economic reasons, that their conduct is something we need to condemn. Uh, certainly in Europe and, and more broadly across the world. Uh, so there are a few quick big questions though, right? Does it need to be regulated in the US? And we can expand this to beyond the US, but I'll focus on the US. And my answer is maybe, right? Regulation is a solution, or it should be, to a problem. Um, what problem? Well, it could be a political problem. It could be a sense of that. But I like to try to solve problems that are economic based. And so that will be my focus. And again, acknowledging that's not always the problem we're trying to solve. But so if we accept that it's trying to solve an economic based question, and I'm not sure everyone would agree that that's true. Um, does the regulation fix that problem? And does it fix the problem at the appropriate scope? So I've identified in, in the short time, there are more. Uh, core areas of concern that the DMA and also more broadly in the US were worried about big tech and even beyond big tech uh, as an antitrust competition matter. The first of which is this growing sense that there's this big data and Andreas sort of hinted at that with this notion that maybe the Schumpeterian competition has changed. Whereas in the past we could rely on that but maybe with big data, with privacy, with network effects we've sort of broken that and we've now sort of ossified market shares. Market power being identified by high market shares. Is that really a reliable indicator of true economic barriers? Exclusion of competitors through these practices. I'll just focus on self-preferencing. There are more, but this has risen to the level where we've now sort of accepted that this is something we should be really worried about. Finally, acquiring nascent and potential competitors. It used to be where we would just assess the competitive mer merits, but today we're saying, Sometimes we don't know, and so we have to, as Aurelian said, we have to be precautionary, and we have to have ex-ante controls of these uh, acquisitions. I only have 20 minutes, so I'm going to go fairly quickly. I apologize, but I'm just going to try to get through everything. So one way we can think of privacy is a relationship that I've seen often, which is that with more market power becomes less privacy quality. Another way of putting that is more competition will be better privacy quality, less competition results in lower privacy quality. So this relationship is something I've read consistently. Uh, let me show you one quote. This is the FTC complaint for Facebook, paragraph 221. Without meaningful competition, Facebook has been able to provide lower levels of service quality on privacy and data protection. This is a very consistent uh, view of the world. What does the evidence actually show? Is this truly the case where more uh, competition means better privacy quality or the opposite. So I went to the FTC right before I came. I went to their website to find their most recent cases on privacy violations. And so this is just an alpha, not alphabetical, but a, a, a timeline from latest to, to uh, further away. So the first company I saw is Chegg, which I've never heard of. Drizzly, I don't even know. And then Cafe Press, I think I've heard of them. Uh, Twitter, okay, so we now have a larger company. One wouldn't call them big tech, but maybe medium tech. Uh, Boost My Score is an obscure site. Uh, Ascension Data and Analytics, uh, OpenX Technologies. Long story short, and this is not a selective sample, I'm just going in order of the latest to further away. It, what it illustrates, and I know this is not a scientific study, is the notion that we're worried about privacy only for big companies is a completely uh, ridiculous notion. Uh, privacy is a problem across firms. And so if we're going to make this theory and, and make regulation based off of it, it should be based off of good evidence. I went to uh, the website, security researchers discover the top 10 app stores. I wanted to see who are the ones who are engaging in the most fraud. And it are these, these sort of obscure games, it looks like. So you're gonna be more in danger 
downloading obscure games than you are probably from Candy Crush or, or something of that nature because they have a brand that they want to preserve, whereas these companies have no brand and they will just take your data and monetize it through that way. So long story short, uh, I've came all this way to promote my paper. No, I, it's, I do have a paper with Professor Cooper who spoke yesterday. And we did, we examined this question, is privacy quality related to market share or market power? Uh, we could argue whether we measured this right or wrong. We just wanted to at least try and, and put a study out there. And so we looked at app quality, uh, privacy of apps, as well as websites based off of third-party independent privacy quality ratings to see if it's correlated with the strength of these apps and the strength of these sites. Just to give the quick results, I won't read through the quotes, but long story short, this paper illustrates there, there was no relationship between the app's market share and the app's privacy quality. And again, these are third-party independent quality. We're not making the assessments and we're just trying to see if there's any correlation um, and there were none. So is the science settled? I don't think either way. So I don't want to say that we're right and so this is the new uh, state of the world. I just don't think it's settled. And so because it's not settled, to make presumptions that uh, by, by sort of disciplining large firms, we're going to have better privacy qualities is really a sort of a, a non-economic result. We can have that belief, but it's not really based on science. How about a little bit of a refinement, moving away from privacy? Maybe it's not the privacy quality that we're worried about per se, it's sort of related, but we're more worried about the collection and data and the ossification, the sort of the barriers that those data uh, provides to large firms. So this is uh, uh, indicative of this view. This is the Stigler report from the University of Chicago. It's very influential in the US. A data advantage over rivals can enable a company to achieve a virtuous circle of critical economies of scale, Economies of scale just means that if you produce more, your cost falls, leading to network effects and a competitive balance in its favor, leading to the gathering of yet more data. This is a very common view of large platforms. Basically, more data means more users, which means more data, and you just can't penetrate it. So the winners keep winning, and the uh, entrants just can't penetrate this like they have in the past. That might be fair. Let's unpack this idea. So again, this is this virtuous data cycle, and I've, called, I've heard it called a data network effect. Couple of observations, though, and I'm not gonna dispute that it doesn't create some barriers. Uh, of course, it means what do we mean by barriers? Uh, research and development also creates barriers as well. We don't condemn that. So the first point I wanna make is, this is entirely premised on increasing the quality to users. If you think through the theory, it's all based off of data makes the product better, which then means more users, which means more data. Observation number two, it is very focused on one dimension in which firms compete, which is data. They clearly want to have more data, but that is not the only reason firms are successful. Um, it may be for certain markets, but it's not a universal rule. There are other factors that determine whether or not firms are successful or not, including algorithms, talent, patents, other innovations. Observation number three, data is not money. Data has to be translated in some manner into uh, monetization. And as a consequence, what we're missing from this theory is this notion of cost. You need to transform data into something valuable. So I like to think of the internet as the ultimate big data. Uh, many of you are probably uh, engaging in scholarly research or thoughts or certainly write pieces that, are, uh, that require a lot of uh, input. Um, there's probably the perfect article out there for you to write. The data is all available to us, but only if select Few, not me, but get these great articles out there, amazing ideas, because they can collate the data in a way that's compelling to society. Uh, it's not just data, it's the ability to take data and make it valuable. Long story short, in terms of data, I think it's a better thing to think of it not as a network effect, but as a network opportunity. Data is an opportunity, and some companies are able to unlock that and achieve success with that opportunity, and some are not. What or not, Aurelian already stole my thunder. He looked at my slides last night, no. Uh, Google Plus, we all know the Google Plus story. Well, we don't. 
We might have never heard of it, but it was launched in 2011. It closed formally in 2019, but it was pretty much dead very early on. Uh, Google, um, if you read through the case study, it wasn't a product that was neglected. Uh, they gave tremendous number of assets. If you are a Gmail user, congratulations, you are also a G Plus user, uh, but I'm guessing most of us never used it or used it at a very low level. So it was not a party, it, it died fairly quickly. Um, here's another one, something more recent. Uh, so I read in 2019 that Lady Gaga was going to launch her new beauty line on Amazon. And we know this is gonna be a success. It's Lady Gaga and Big Data Amazon. This has, to, this has to work. Here's the page. It was gonna be amazing. So what really happened? So she gives up on Amazon and she left. And where did she go? She signed an exclusive with Sephora. Um, Stadia, this is this online cloud platform for gaming that Google launched. Another Google product bites the dust. So it's clear, it is clear, it is not just data that creates success, but often we get tunnel vision and we think it's really data when it's not. Let me give you another example of disruption. I know this is perhaps hard to read, but looking at 2016, you can see that the dominant firm in the US in delivering food, so this is food delivery, was Grubhub. They, had, they were enormous, they were first mover, and this is the era of big data. 2016 was clearly a big data era. They should have dominated and continued under this theory, yet you can see that uh, DoorDash grew tremendously over that time. So these theories based off of data just don't fit, even if we bring in case studies that are more contemporaneous. This is on browsers, it's hard to see, I apologize, but um, Chrome is the green one that, that went from almost nothing, um, sort of, what was it, about 10 years ago, um, maybe a little bit further back, and the one that lost a lot of share was uh, Internet Explorer. Um, TikTok, it entered the US, it was I think in China earlier, sorry about that, it entered the US in 2018 and the growth has been phenomenal um, even though they were the, the, uh, the challenger. Okay, but what about my high market shares? Uh, monopolies are everywhere, allegedly. Um, so in antitrust we have this thing called relevant markets. Right? That's how we discipline the analysis. When someone asserts Facebook is a monopoly, the first question any good competition lawyer uh, responds is, a monopoly over what? What exactly are we talking about? So the FTC complaint gives us an answer. FTC holds monopoly power in the market for personal, social, networking service in the United States, primarily due to its control of Facebook and Instagram. Fair enough. It defines the competitors as basically this set. Snapchat, they do list Google Plus, even though it's a defunct product, and MySpace, which we all know is, is barely alive. It's still online, but no one really uses it. So uh, in the FTC's complaint, they've drawn a, a line and listed everyone else except Snapchat as the only competitor to Facebook. And yes, you're going to be a monopoly when you define it very narrowly. Couple of points. Um, the whole exercise of market share is endogenous. Endogenous to what? How you define who's in the market. If you define it narrowly, you're gonna have high shares. If you define it broadly, it decreases. This is the goal of all good competition law, right? If you're on the plaintiff side, you want it to be very narrow. If you're on the defense side, you want it very broadly. I'm not telling anyone new this information, but that's still very important when we're talking about policy. We often define these markets in certain ways that don't make sense outside of antitrust cases. Okay, that being said, even if you've properly defined the market, even if market shares are really high, is this misbehavior or market success? So there's one view, and I call it the stain of original sin, uh, staying in the biblical theme. This is from the DG Comp report from a couple years ago. Dominant digital firms have strong incentives to engage in anti-competitive behavior. So the way I read that, and I know dominant has a certain meaning in competition law, and so I, I don't want to comment on that, but in the US we read dominance as high share. And high share doesn't mean you have the stain of original sin, in my view. I, I dispute this as a scientific fact. There is another view. This is the view in the US, which is still very good law, and this is the Trinco case by Justice Scalia, and it was a 9-0 decision, 
accepted by all the justices. And it's basically the idea that the mere possession of monopoly power and charging monopoly prices is not only unlaw not unlawful, it's an important element of the entire system. It's an opportunity to charge prices uh, that attracts resources, business acumen, induces risk, produces innovation, and economic growth. So these are very different views of the world in terms of what monopoly power brings. So long story short, a very static view, which Aurelian also talked about, it views monopoly as bad, and that's fair. But a more dynamic view sees monopoly as part of a larger process that you need to incentivize firms to create and take risk. Intellectual property rights falls firmly under this. This is the grand bargain of intellectual property rights. We give you exclusivity over your idea for 20, in the US, depends on jurisdiction, but 20, for 20 years, nobody can touch your idea. What is the trade-off? Well, we're giving a lot of static inefficiency and harm, but the trade-off is that we have innovation. Yet, I don't think we have that perspective with competition law. Um, we often lose that, and we're so focused on the static loss. Okay, with that, let me get to my three final points, which I will go through quickly. Practices that are common across all the firms in a market, regardless of market share, such as self-preferencing, do not suddenly become harmful because you have a higher share. It might, but it doesn't mean it's a per se. Second point, when um, a business implements a practice when they entered, when they had no share, but grew successful, doesn't suddenly become bad because they're successful. And I'm gonna to try to give an illustration to all three if, if, if I have time. And finally, when we talk about nascent and, competi uh, nascent and potential competitors, if it's bad when you acquire them, when is it good when you acquire them? Is it ever good? And if it is good, what does that look like? So self-preferencing, just real quick. This is DuckDuckGo, no market share in the US. Where do they put, when I put in privacy app, so they sell themselves as a the privacy. They put themselves as the top ad. They have this huge advertising off to the right. This is Microsoft Bing. When I typed in Map of Budapest, uh, this is the Bing maps. These are Bing images. And so you can see they take off the entire top of the page for their stuff. Here's Yahoo. They are big in Yahoo Finance. They are the dominant finance site in the US. It's the entire page is their stuff. Let's go to Walmart. This is their number one uh, um, private label equate. They list it before any other product. And, they, and Target, they don't list it first, but they list it third. Amazon, who is under scrutiny for self-preferencing, certainly does the same. But what I'm trying to illustrate is, if it is a common industry practice that is independent of market power, perhaps, perhaps there is a justification based off of consumer benefit, at least something to explore rather than to per se condemn. And finally, let me really just close here. Apple versus Epic is alleging that Apple's uh, App Store has all these policies that are very onerous, 30% commission, no, um, you have to use Apple Pay, uh, various other, oh, and they are the exclusive App Store on the Apple device. When Apple App Store was introduced one year after the original iPhone, they had all these policies in place. And here we are in 2020, when it was first brought, uh, they're alleging that that original policy when Apple had no share is anti-competitive. So in my view, it's not that this is a per se legal thing. It just means I raise questions whether or not this practice which they had when they had zero share is now suddenly bad when they have a more dominant share. And I think that's about it other than um, here's Instagram after they were acquired. Here's Facebook after they, were acquired, after they acquired Instagram. If this is bad, and maybe it is, if this is bad, so I've heard that this is the worst acquisition in US history. I'm not joking. Um, there are professors who call Facebook, Instagram, the worst acquisition in US history. What would a bad acquisition or a good acquisition look like? What is it supposed to look like is my question. And it's just a legitimate question. And if the answer is there's nothing it could look like for it to be good, then we're now no longer in economics. We're in politics. We're in 
uh, per se condemnation. Thank you.